professora Janis Cunha, por favor, tem a palavra. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I work for the National Science Foundation uh, in the United States, and I was hired um, about 14 years ago to look at the problem that we were having that not very many um, minorities, women, persons with disabilities, not very many people were, con were participating in computer science. So uh, if you look together at the groups that were not participating, that's women, uh, African Americans, Hispanic, Native Americans, and persons with disabilities, uh, that's 70% of our population. So it's a pretty significant group. And I was hired to try and figure out how we could up the, the participation of these groups. Um, I work for the National Science Foundation, not the Department of Education, so primarily we fund research into computer science in my division. Uh, we don't primarily fund education, so I was told to, um, to not worry about K-12, but to really focus on uh, the undergraduate and graduate levels. But it turns out that if you look at the data, uh, particularly with respect to women, uh, this is the data that we had when I started at NSF. So it starts in 1971, and this graph goes up to 2005, which is about when I was starting to look at these problems. The green line is um, all of the women who show up at college, the percentage of women who show up at college saying they want to major in, in physical sciences. So that's been going up over time. The blue line is the percentage of women who show, the percentage of students who say that they want to major in engineering, and those are, uh, that's the percentage of women in that group. And you can see that that's not very high, but still it's not plummeting. The red line is what happened to computer science. So this started in the mid, the beginning of the 80s, and it was a pretty precipitous drop. Um, I'll kind of slip slip ahead to the um, to what's happened since then and then I'll go back and talk about what we did but you can see that since then if you go up to 2017 there's been a definite increase in computer science um, and in all the uh, physical sciences in fact so women aren't coming back but they're still very far below where they were in the early uh, 1980s if you look at the the data at the undergraduate level, you can see that the computer science degrees going to women since the mid-80s dropped from about 34% down to 17% now. It's been as low as 14%. So they also had this very precipitous drop uh, from the 80s down. So the question really was what was happening in K-12 that would cause this uh, dramatic decrease? And the answer was that not much was happening in K-12, right? There was very little going on in computer science. It was very calm. Um, not much was happening. And in fact, if you looked at uh, the previous 20 years, the percentage of uh, high school students who in 2005 were taking a any computer science course was 19%, but that had dropped from 26% 20 years ago. So we were offering less and less computer science to students in high school, which is pretty surprising because computer science is such a huge part of life. It's everywhere. It's part of all of science, all of engineering. It's part of the way we communicate. It's part of the way we entertain. Uh, it's, it's a very pervasive field. And so to be teaching less and less of it um, was kind of shocking. Um, so. First of all, you might ask, why does, why does this matter? Well, in some sense, it matters because of workforce issues. If you look at this data, it shows that 71% um, of all job openings in the United States for the next 10 years are predicted to be in STEM fields. So that's science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Um, so that's um, a lot. It's it's actually, I, I misquoted that. It's seven of all of the job openings in STEM, so all of them in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, 71% are in computer science. 
So that's a huge proportion of the kind of high tech, high innovation uh, kind of jobs that uh, drive our economy. Uh, if you look at the number of degrees that were given out in computer science as compared to other STEM fields, it was only 8%. So we're producing way too few computer scientists to, uh, to match the workforce requirements. So, but there are other reasons why this matters as well. So it matters because it's a loss of opportunity for individuals. So a lot of the good jobs that are going to be available in the next 10, 20, 30 years are going to involve pretty intensive computer science skills. And so we're locking people out of those opportunities and we're locking them out of it as they hit high school. So in ninth grade, we're saying you don't have the opportunities to go into these fields, which is really unfortunate. Um, it's also a, a loss of a well-prepared workforce. There are very few jobs uh, that are opening up now as new jobs that don't require computational skills. Uh, even what we've considered before to be like uh, factory jobs and, um, and other kinds of jobs still now are requiring some sort of computer science skills. Uh, it's a loss of innovation that's needed to drive uh, a globally competitive uh, economy. So if you look at information technology, it has pretty much driven the U.S. economy for decades. And to say that we're no longer going to compete in that realm because we're not going to be training people in that realm is, uh, is pretty, would be pretty devastating. And finally, uh, it's a loss of national security. As you probably heard, we're all very concerned about our elections being hacked. And there are lots of issues around privacy and security that people are going to be called on to make decisions about when they vote. And we need to have a computationally aware uh, society. So there are lots of reasons um, that computer science needs to be taught. So um, the, the reason that students really need this is that computer science teaches lots of things besides just coding. Uh, it teaches about the logic of um, pr problem solving. Uh, it teaches students to think really differently about ways in which uh, they can go about solving problems. And that way of looking at problem solving and looking at things in the world really uh, goes across all, is useful to them in all other kinds of endeavors as well. Um, there's, uh, it teaches them to create digital artifacts uh, and how, to, uh, how those digital artifacts interact with the world around them. So it looks at society and ethical issues as well. Uh, and it gets our students so that they are, see themselves as creators of technology and not just users of technology. So um, with all this evidence, it was decided that I should back up and really think about what was happening in K-8, uh, uh, K-12. So we started at the high school level, which is grades 9 through 12, and really looked at what was going on there. And one of the first things that we did was to fund the development of a new course called Exploring Computer Science uh, that was introduced in Los Angeles. Exploring Computer Science is a really cool course. It's teaches kids to program, but it's not programming-centric. It's not the whole part of the course. It also teaches them about algorithms and um, software engineering and software design and um, implications for society, implications for ethics, ethical issues around programming. And it shows them the very wide range of applications that computing has. And in particular, it tries to get students to, um, to understand how computing relates to their interests, no matter what their interests are. If they're interested in sports, or they're interested in journalism, or history, or math, or um, earth sciences, or biology, or healthcare, education, all of these fields are dramatically impacted or will be dramatically impacted in the future by computation. So it teaches them the wide range of things that you can do with computing. And in fact, it's a really exciting course for most kids. Most kids really like this. Um, but at that point, we still had a course, when, after we had funded that course, that was in three high schools. And there are about 36,000 high schools across the United States. So the 
question at that point became, well, how do we get into all of those schools? And the United States has a completely decentralized uh, educational system. So every state can, and there are 50 states, they can do whatever they want in terms of education. So they set their own standards, they set their own licensure for teachers, they set their own graduation requirements. But it's even worse than that because within a local community, the community and the principals really control the schools. And so in fact, they don't have to abide by many of the things that the state says and they set their own rules and their own procedures and their own curriculum. And so it's very difficult to imagine how you could impact that across the country. And in fact, the United States government, the federal government, is not supposed to uh, mess with education. So education is supposed to be handled on a local community level and not from the federal government. So there are limits to what the federal government can do, but we chose to act within those limits and kind of um, stay with those limits. So, but the question then was, how are we going to get the change to happen everywhere? It was, uh, we weren't even in all the schools in Los Angeles at this point. We're only in three high schools. Uh, and so how to get that to happen? And it seemed to be hard to uh, look at just this one course and get that change to happen. But we also have uh, the college board. The college board uh, runs a bunch of standardized tests that are used to, uh, that are control admissions to colleges, basically. Colleges look at these scores because it's the only standardization they have across the country. And so they run a series of courses. Uh, some are just general knowledge and general abilities and capabilities, but others are for specific subjects. So we tried to convince the College Board that they needed a new course to introduce computing. They had a course for computing, but it was almost all programming. It was programming in Java and it was a whole year of programming in Java. And for kids that didn't know anything about computing, why would they want to program in Java for a year, right? And even if they had, what could they do with that afterwards? They had no real idea. And so this course was designed to be different than the other College Board courses. It wasn't a course for, um, for it wasn't a course that, that mirrored entry-level college courses. It was a course that was much broader than that, that was really designed to get kids excited about computer science, to get them programming, to get them feeling that they had capabilities and competencies in computing. Uh, and so that new course, uh, we funded the development of that new course as well. It's very expensive to create one of these courses. I had no idea how much money this was gonna cost. It was about, um, we put in about $8 million and the College Board put in about six. So it was quite an expensive course to develop and it took a long time. Uh, the course itself didn't become uh, official till 2017. The interesting thing about both the Exploring Computer Science course, which is kind of an introductory level course for kids who have had no background, and then the AP course, which is more of a follow-on course for students who are more, uh, have some introduction to computing and want more. Um, so the interesting thing about these courses is they have very similar philosophy. They were conceptually based. So the idea wasn't to teach kids every last detail of programming, uh, but to give them some feeling of that they could program, some kind of empowerment, but also the much broader view of computer science. So they really look at the fundamental concepts of computing. Uh, they're designed to be engaging and fun. And one of the ways they do that is to have them be um, rigorous, so they actually teach the kids quite a bit of things. Um, to have them be uh, hands-on, so the kids actually get to build things, they build programs, uh, and they build, get to build things about things that they care about. So they don't have predetermined assignments, they have uh, projects that they create and that they then program, and so it's much more meaningful to them and much more exciting to them. Um, 
And the courses were designed to be inspiring. When I started in computing, I'm really dating myself here, but when I started in computing, computers were as big as this room. And they didn't really do anything that I wanted to have done, but you had this feeling that they could do anything, that you were just so close to uh, being able to control them to change the world. And I think the kids now have pretty much lost that. We give them cell phones, and their cell phones kind of do everything they think they want done. And they don't have this kind of big vision about what computing can mean to them or to the world. And so part of the job of this course is to bring that back, to really inspire kids with what we can do now with computing, but what we'll be able to do in 10 or 20 years with computing, and how they could be a part of those, those big transformations. Uh, and then finally, both of the courses were designed for equity, in the sense that we wanted all kids to be involved. There's this myth that only the smartest kids can learn computer science, that it's very difficult and very hard, but we don't tell kids only the very smartest kids can read, only the very smartest kids can do math. We tell them that everybody does reads and everybody does math. So we wanted the message that everybody does computer science as well. Uh, and they were designed they were designed to make sure that they, told, they pointed out to kids why computing was relevant to their lives. In the examples that they used, in the assignments that they let the kids design, um, that this wasn't just something that they needed to know for the sake of passing a requirement, but it was something that could enrich their lives. So, of course, the biggest problem was teachers, right? We did not have teachers in the United States at that point who were trained in computer science. Uh, I was once giving a talk about these two great courses and how wonderful it was going to be, and uh, somebody in the back of the room raised their hand and said, mm, yeah, but who's going to teach these courses? And that hadn't been a problem, really, that we addressed very much, certainly from the point of view of the National Science Foundation. So. That was around 2007 or 8, and we really started focusing on how you train teachers. So we can train teachers at the pre-service level before they go out and teach while they're still in school, and we're working on how to do that. Again, colleges, universities can teach whatever they want, so getting those changes to happen all over is very difficult. Um, we've also looked at tr training the teachers who are already there. And there are um, lots and lots and lots of teachers, uh, K-12. There are um, millions of them. And so the question is, how do you get all these teachers retrained so that with no background in, in computing, they can now teach advanced courses in computing or introduce computing to kindergarten kids or first graders or fifth graders? And so we've spent a considerable amount of time working on that. It's also the case that we started at the high school level because if you get kids uh, excited about computing at the middle school or elementary school levels, and, and then they don't see anything through the four years of high school, they've forgotten it and they've moved on to other things. So the hope is that we would have computer science um, K, pre-K-12, and that computer science would be a pathway that all kids would take. And so we've also funded a lot of work in what those courses should look like. What should a third grader know? What should a sixth grader know? What should someone who enters high school know? And we're trying to build whole K-12 pathways in computer science. Uh, I don't know how long kids go to school in Brazil, but in the United States, the school days are typically like six hours, which leaves them with a ton of time outside of school. And so we're also looking at what you can do outside of school. There are lots of camps, there's lots of after-school programs, there's lots of special activities for kids. And how do we get computer science woven into many of those programs? Uh, we have the Girl Scouts who do lots of work around technology. We have 
for H clubs. There's lots of different national organizations that work with kids outside of school, and so we've also looked at how we get computer science into uh, those schools, into those uh, opportunities. So to go back to the uh, computer science AP course, uh, that turned out to be really successful. Um, it had, uh, the, it actually didn't launch until 2017. In 2017, it was the largest launch of any of the College Board courses ever. We had uh, two, more than 2,005 uh, schools that offered computer science. Uh, there were 2,700 teachers who successfully passed the audit to be able to teach computer science, AP princi CS principles. Uh, it was in 49 states. There was only one state that didn't participate, and that state uh, this year had five schools that did participate, so they've gotten better. Um, we had 2,700 teachers who were trained, trained. That was a lot, and 50,000 students took the first exam. So if you take computer science principles at the high school level, you don't have to take the exam, and the exams cost a lot of money, so not everybody does. So, but still 50,000 was the largest number ever. And this year, uh, we did even better. We had 76,000 students. So that's a pretty impressive number. Remember that one of our goals was to include more uh, demographics in these courses. And so if you look at this graph, the uh, bottom grayish bars were the number of students from 2007 to 2016. This is for um, women. This was the number of women who took computer science uh, AP, cor uh, AP test. So there were the two courses. There was the Java course and the new, brand new course. The brand new course and the Java course for 2017 are shown in blue. But you can see that the number of women who took computer science more than doubled uh, at the high school level. Uh, if you look at what happened to African American students that uh, also way more than doubled with the introduction of this new course. And if you look at Latino students, that uh, went up even more. So we were reaching more demographics with these courses. We're quite excited about it. To some extent, the schools that were able to introduce this course early on were schools that uh, had more money and more resources. But we're working very hard now with the schools with lower levels of resources to get them participating as well. And when that happens, I think these numbers will go up uh, considerably further. There are a couple things that made this happen uh, in the United States kind of across the country that were not necessarily uh, done at the, from the federal level. Uh, the first of them was the introduction of the organization Code.org. Code.org is a, uh, a nonprofit organization that has kind of uh, captured the funding from major companies, so Google, Facebook, Microsoft, um, Many of the major IT companies have given significant support to Code.org. And Code.org is a, uh, a marketing genius. They have been selling computer science with spots on TV, with videos that they put out to be shown to uh, parents, with uh, the Hour of Code, which has involved millions of kids across the world. Uh, so they've done a lot to just publicize the importance of computer science and the notion that Anybody can do computer science, that this is not just something that should be reserved for the top students in the top schools. So Code.org was uh, hugely important. As a result of their marketing uh, campaign, uh, a recent poll found that nine in 10 parents wanted their kids to learn computer science in schools. That's a huge number. Before this, it was negligible number of parents who thought computer science is too hard, they thought computer science changes all the time, so why would you want to uh, have the kids do that? There's so much else the kids need to learn, why should they push something else out so they could learn computer science? But all of those uh, concerns have really been pushed to the wayside, and uh, nine in 10 parents want their kids to learn computer science. That's very important because it's parents that drive 
what goes on in their local schools. It's parents' complaints that make the principals do things. Um, and so there's quite a big push from parents right now to get computer science into their kids' schools. Um, at the same time that this push started, you can see that only one in four high schools were still teaching, were teaching computer science. So there's a lot more that has to be done. But the belief is that this new, this new concern on the part of parents will push much further. Um, it certainly had an effect on the previous administration in the United States. President Obama was a very big supporter of computer science education and of supporting diversity in computer science education. Um, he created the CS for All initiative, which when he introduced to Congress, he asked for $8 billion to fund this across the country to get teachers trained and ready to teach computer science. Of course, he didn't get the $8 billion, but he did get $120 million uh, directed at the National Science Foundation, where I work, uh, towards computer science. He also was very helpful in publicizing this. Lots of people saw him on TV. He was the first president there in the lower box to code. Uh, he worked with some kids to do some coding. So uh, he was very influential in getting both the government and the um, the general population to really care about computer science. And if you look at what happened over that time, computer science went from being something that nobody was talking about to something that all sorts of people were talking about. So this was a press announcement around an NSF, that's where I work, the National Science Foundation, one of our projects uh, to introduce computer science into Cleveland schools. Very unusual that the press, the local news, carries uh, news of an NSF award. So that was um, a sign of things are changing. Um, here's one for the whole state of Washington, where the governor has declared that all kids will learn computer science. Uh, here's one for Florida uh, International, where NSF gave them $2 million to introduce computer science. Um, here's one for the Bronx, a part of New York City. Here's one in Oakland, and I really loved this. The uh, Obama administration kicked off their initiative in Oakland, and I like that because for years I had been talking about Oakland, where there were 47,000 high school students, and not a one of them had ever taken a computer science course. Um, and so they were kind of this place where there was simply nothing offered to students, and now it's required uh, in all of their schools. Um, Here's uh, a big coup was that uh, NSF had given Chicago many awards to try and infiltrate computer science into their schools. And it was so successful that they have now made it a graduation requirement for every high school student must take a course in computer science uh, to graduate. And that is impressive because it also means that they understand that they can deliver a high quality course to that many students and have it in all of their high schools and have well-trained teachers. So it was a big step forward. Uh, and uh, then uh, to kind of pull all these disparate pieces together and to give people a place where they could go to look at what was going on, what research was being done, what things were available to kids, what things were available in after school programs, to kind of be a one-stop place where people could go for uh, information. Uh, we funded the development of an organization called cs for all It now has quite a bit of its own funding from foundations around the country, so it's no longer uh, reliant on the government support. So as I said, I work for the National Science Foundation, and we have really a limited role in what we can do in education. It would be great if we could just announce that everybody, every school was going to have computer science, but we have no way of doing that. So. Um, what we've done is to fund little pieces and to fund um, the creation of knowledge around how to train teachers, uh, how to recruit teachers, how to retain them, how to recruit students, how to retain them, um, how to provide accurate information to state and local governments so that they can make their own decisions. So we have quite a few projects that we've funded over the last uh, 10 years, we've spent about, uh, about $15 million a year, uh, and now that's been upped considerably to around between 20, about $25 million a year recently, 
and that will continue into the next couple years. So we fund um, CS for All, the organization that I just mentioned. Um, the one that's right under that, we fund a virtual community of practice for teachers, so teachers from all over the country can go to find out what's new in computer science, they can go to have webinars around particular topics. Uh, there's quite a few things that uh, that that provides online for teachers, so even teachers who don't teach at a school with other computer science teachers or who are in a school that's really remote and there aren't even schools around them that have computer science, um, they can have a place to go and get information. We also funded the uh, ESEP Alliance, which is a, a fairly large alliance that, um, that looks at how you develop state pathway, state, statewide K-12 pathways in computer science. So they work with the leaders of states who are interested in doing this to uh, disseminate information, to give them toolkits about how, where to start and what they need to get going. Uh, so they work quite closely with, uh, with state level organizations. We've also funded uh, a lot of the development of, um, I can't say curricula because we don't develop curricula, but we do develop instructional materials. We've funded a lot of development of instructional materials and for all of those projects, we've added a component on how do you train the teachers to do this. And so we have uh, Bootstrap, which is the uh, project with the little boot up there in its logo. Uh, that's a great project that introduces programming into algebra courses, and first to algebra courses, and they have data that shows that when you do that, the students perform better in algebra. Uh, and the reason for that is they're programming in scheme, which is a functional language, so they're manipulating functions. So that when they see functions in their algebra course, they're not strange things. They're things that they understand how they work. They understand what a parameter and a variable is. So it's extremely uh, helpful for them. Um, the other three up there, Mobile CSP, The Beauty and Joy of Computing, and Re You Teach CS Principles, those are all big projects to disseminate the College Board's CS Principles course. The College Board creates uh, not a curriculum, but a framework. So it's a list of learning objections, objectives, what kids should know, and then how you would know that they knew it. So what kinds of things you could test them on. And to that framework, you can put lots of different curricula. So we have uh, funded maybe six or seven of them. There's three of them right there. And each of those curriculum projects has a teacher training component with it. And so that we've now trained um, probably 7,500 to um, 10,000 teachers uh, to teach these courses. There's still lots of challenges left to make this all work. Um, we are making progress. We're in maybe 10,000 schools now, but we still have 36,000 um, schools nationwide. So even at the high school level, we have quite a bit of work left to do, and we're in a lot fewer schools at the K-8 level. So um, issues that we have are how do you reach all schools uh, and school districts? Again, that's a problem with there's no centralization. We also have quite a few of um, low-performing schools, which are not surprisingly often the low-resource schools, so schools that are very strapped for money, they're strapped for finding good teachers. Um, they're trying very hard to meet their math and reading requirements, and so those schools are particularly difficult to work with. So the schools that are low performing, low SES, that's the socioeconomic background of their parents. So low income students attending low resource schools, very difficult target to reach. Um, and how do you provide all teachers with professional development? And not just one time professional development. Right now we have about 10,000 teachers who have taken a course over the summer and then had some follow-on through that year. But even beyond that, teachers need follow-on professional development. Computer science isn't a field that sits still. So 10 years from now, we would hope that these teachers would be teaching a modern, updated computer science. So they need ongoing support. And how to build that all in so that it happens um, not with NSF funding, because our funding is limited and our funding is limited in duration, but how it just becomes part of what school systems do. 
So the first three bullets there have little dollar signs next to them. I think those are things we know how to do. We just have to have the will to do it, and you can translate will into money. Um, we have to have resources for those schools. So that's where the challenge is there. But then the lower bullets are all things that we don't really yet know, and so there's a challenge to how to build that. Um, what are appropriate learning progressions for K-12? Uh, we don't really know what a third grader should know. What is the appropriate age to introduce recursion? Uh, there are many things that we just don't know. We've had decades of studying these things in math and biology and, and chemistry, but we have not done that work in computer science by and large. So those are things that NSF is funding at the moment. Um, how do we get to uh, entice students from the underrepresented groups to come into computer science? So if you look at gender in particular, girls have the idea that uh, computing is only for geeks, that there are uh, people who do computing have no social life, that uh, people who do computing don't have time to go on dates, they don't have time to get married, they don't have time to have kids, they just sit at their computer and type all day. So they have many misconceptions about what computer science is really like, and those are hard to change. So how do we uh, work on changing that and making our classrooms inclusive so that once we get them to show up at class, they actually like it and stay? Uh, and then uh, how do we connect the out-of-school world to the in-school world? And lots of times there's actually contention between those two groups because they're kind of fighting for the same money in many cases. And so how do we get them to cooperate and work together? There are so many kids who spend a lot of time in after-school programs. Um, why aren't they learning computer science there? And why isn't the computer science that they're learning connected back into the classroom so that they're complementary uh, instead of kind of disparate things? And then um, sustainability. So it's not enough to just train a teacher once because computer science changes, it needs updating, you have to uh, constantly look for new applications, new things to excite the kids with. Uh, but also teachers, I don't know about Brazil, but teachers in the United States do not stay in teaching long. There's a huge turnover of teachers. Uh, half of the teachers who start leave by the end of their second year. Uh, so, and even then, after that, even if they stay through two years, the attrition is still really, really high. So how do you make it so that all of this funding that's coming from code.org, from private foundations, from the National Science Foundation, from our Department of Education, all of this money that's putting into, being put into funding right now to train teachers, how do you make that a sustainable, ongoing thing so that this happens even when all of this funding ends? Because right now we're funding the latest new thing. When that's not the latest new thing, we'll move on to funding other things. So. Um, how do you make this a part of what school districts do all the time? Like school districts all the time teach math. They all the time teach English. They sometimes teach science. But those things are done within their own budgets. The training is done locally. How do we get that to be sustained across the country beyond this? And then there's the issue of what's happening at the college level. So right now at the college level over the last four or five years, enrollments in computer science have gone through the roof. They have, many universities have four or five, six times as many students as they had just five years ago in computer science. And the interesting thing about these students is that many of them are not interested in being software engineers. Many of them are biologists who want to use sophisticated computation in biology. Many of them are journalists. Many of them are historians. Many of them are educators. There are people who have other interests as their primary interest, but they understand that they need a lot of computer science. So in the past, these students would take one computer science course, check the box, and be done. But now what they're doing is taking five, six, seven computer science courses, and they're really taxing what we can do in higher ed in terms of our, we have courses at the higher level that used to have 35 students in where you could teach a really in-depth very personalized course. Now all of a sudden you've got 400 students in that same course. And the very style of teaching, how does that work, is, is extremely different. And universities uh, don't have the ability to move around faculty. 
So they have a certain number of faculty positions that they have. They give tenure, so once you're there, you're there for life. And they don't have the ability to say, oh, we don't need as many teachers here. We'll hire more faculty in computer science. That's very difficult to do at the university level. It's also the case that the programs that we're teaching are not right. The programs that we're teaching are how to develop great software engineers, but we're not really teaching how to use data science in biology, how to use data science in marketing, how to use machine learning in marketing, how to use machine learning in education. So all of these questions are not really being addressed thoroughly. And so uh, the National Science Foundation is now looking at what are the implications for all these students coming through K-12 now with computer science backgrounds, how's that gonna change higher education? And how is the uh, ubiquity of computer science, meaning that it's part of what scientists do, what engineers do, what biologists do, what lawyers do, what journalists do, what historians do, how does that reposition computer science in the university where it's not single stovepipe thing? So all of this has changed so much since the la in the last uh, 14 years from when I first started NSF. And we had this kind of calm view of the ocean where not much is happening. And now our view is much different. Uh, we have more teachers showing up wanting to do this than we can train. We have more schools trying to get involved. We have more implications for the university. Um, but we're not alone. There are many different organizations that are helping with this. So code.org, I already mentioned. ACM is an international community for computer science professionals. They're quite involved. Uh, the National Center for Women and Information uh, in, for, the National Center for Women and Information in Technology has a ton of resources involved. They have a whole K-12 um, alliance that they've created. They have a whole social science network that's doing a lot of evaluation on the K-12 alliance activities. So they're quite involved. Um, Teach for America is an interesting program where they take uh, undergraduates, when they graduate, they take them and they have them do community service by volunteering to teach in a low resource school around the country. And so often this is a way that these very low resource schools can start new things. So they are actively looking at having these volunteers teach computer science. Uh, last year they had 8,000 graduating uh, students who applied to and agreed to teach computer science if they were chosen. So that's a pretty big number. They don't have that many people that they can accept, but I think it shows that they could potentially have a lot of influence. Project Lead the Way is an organization that looks at, edu at edu engineering education, and they have um, an, one track on engineering, one track on biomedical training, and now they've introduced a computer science track, K-12, so they're also helping. Uh, the Computer Science Teachers Association is very involved in this, obviously. Um, we have private foundations. Uh, the Infosys Foundation USA uh, has spent a lot of money on training computer science teachers. I just spoke last week at a, an a meeting where they had um, 500 teachers from around the country come in for a week of teacher training. Uh, they've done quite a bit. Donors Choose is an organization where teachers can go online and ask for funds to do something good with their students. And then uh, a lot of philanthropies go through and look at these requests and fund things. Private people go through and fund them. It's kind of a crowdsourcing uh, way of getting funding. So um, Donors Choose has agreed to, uh, to really promote projects in computer science education. And so they're getting quite a bit of funding through that way to pay for teachers to uh, be able to attend these courses over the summer. Um, we've also worked within the government with the Department of Education, uh, the Defense Department. Defense Department is very interested. They have a lot of, obviously they have a lot of people who are serving in the military and they're very interested in what happens to their kids and are their kids being given uh, really up-to-date education, and so they're interested in um, looking in particular at schools that serve military kids, so schools around military bases, and getting computer science into those schools. 
Um, we worked very closely with the previous administration and the White House, uh, and we're working with the U.S. Trade and Patent Office at the moment. So there's lots of different organizations that have come to the table to work on this. And the most amazing thing for me that's happened is how many people, how many uh, teachers and computer science faculty across the country have gotten involved in this effort. So it's been um, quite startling. Before this, very few faculty were concerned about computer science education K-12. They mostly complained that students weren't very well prepared when they got to college. But now they've really started working. Hundreds of them have started working in K-12 trying to change things. Uh, and lots and lots of teachers volunteered to get involved in this effort before it really even was an effort. So they did a lot of this on uh, their own time. So we have um, quite a few teachers and faculty who've been involved. And uh, this, uh, I'm not sure how long it's set for now. It normally runs for 15 minutes. Um, and there's probably another thousand names that I could easily add to that now since we created these slides. But I will end my presentation there and hope to answer uh, any questions that you might have.